will look back to the generation of the 1970s at how we've conducted ourselves. And they will say, God bless America. Thank you very much. We believe that peace is at hand in a matter of weeks or less. Tonight, I would like to give my answer to those who have suggested that I resign. I have no intention whatever of walking away from the job I was elected to do. I have never heard or seen such outrageous, vicious, distorted reporting in 27 years of public life. I'm not blaming anybody for that. I welcome this kind of examination because people have got to know whether or not their president's a crook. Well, I'm not a crook. I burned everything I've got. The Tonight Show will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you the following NBC News special report. Mr. Cox's uh, comment when he was told that he was apparently about to be fired was whether ours shall continue to be a government of laws and not of men is now for Congress and ultimately the American people. An investigator appointed to investigate scandals was fired because he insisted on investigating scandals. That the president may have an even more grave constitutional crisis on his hands. In my career as a correspondent, I never thought I'd be announcing these things. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. thing is happening here, he is getting applause, not necessarily from the reporters, but from the Justice Department employees who are, as you see, lining the balcony. This is unusual. Hey, okay. Okay. Hey, hey, back of the room now, and then they'll come hey, Did you order the FBI to take over the offices on Saturday night, and if so, why? Guilty. Oh, no, no, no. General, 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 General. General. Amid this chaos, the White House failed to carry out its plan to dismiss Cox's staff. So, the rest of the prosecution staff sat tight. Uh, the White House announced last night that you were abolished. Now, when did you begin to well, get word that you weren't abolished? You know, the White House announced we were abolished, but uh, if they announce the sky is green and then you look up and the sky is blue, um, now, I presume that uh, in the normal course of events that to abolish an agency to take some time. We are gonna try like hell. We are a criminal prosecution force. We have reason to believe there's been some serious crime and we wanna prosecute it. In recent months, members of my administration and officials of the Committee for the Re-Election of the President, including some of my closest friends and most trusted aides, have been charged with involvement in what has come to be known as the Watergate Affair. I first learned from news reports of the Watergate break-in. I was appalled at this senseless, illegal action. And I was shocked to learn that employees of the re-election committee were apparently among those guilty. I condemn any attempts to cover up in this case, no matter who is involved. Well, his reaction is that um, since he did nothing wrong, was not part of the cover-up, that um, little purpose would be served in stepping aside. Today, in one of the most difficult decisions of my presidency, I accepted the resignations of two of my closest associates in the White House, Bob Haldeman, John Ehrlichman, two of the finest public servants it has been my privilege to know. The House Judiciary Committee has just approved its first article of impeachment against President Nixon. Yeah, yeah. And that's a, an NBC camera, I presume. <laughs> Standard joke. <laughs> Let me see that. You get these lights properly out. Yeah. So, my eyes always have a little fine as they get the past 60. That's enough. 
I have never been a quitter. To leave office before my term is completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my body. I don't believe that I ought to quit because I'm not a quitter. And incidentally, Pat's not a quitter. After all, her name was Patricia Ryan and she was born on St. Patrick's Day. And you know, the Irish never quit. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. But the greatness comes and you're really tested when you take some knocks, some disappointments, when sadness comes. Because only if you've been in the deepest valley can you ever know how magnificent it is to be on the highest mountain. My fellow Americans, our long national nightmare is over. Our Constitution works. Our great republic is a government of laws and not of men. Here, the people rule. The apparent certainty of the president's imminent resignation raised two big questions on Capitol Hill. What to do about the impeachment, and should Mr. Nixon be granted immunity from criminal prosecution? Bruce Morton reports on the House. Some members of Congress say that unless the president's resignation includes some confession of guilt, the impeachment process should continue. But that decision is up to the leaders of the House. I feel if the president resigned, that should be the end of the impeachment proceedings. This should put an end to, to, the, to the Watergate affair as an issue involving uh, incumbent public officials. Former White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman found guilty today on five counts in the Watergate cover-up trial. Former White House Domestic Affairs Advisor John Ehrlichman, four counts, guilty. John Mitchell, former Attorney General and head of the Nixon Re-Election Committee, five counts, guilty. Robert Mardian, former political coordinator for the Re-Election Committee, one count, guilty. Kenneth Parkinson, lawyer for the re-election committee, two counts, the only defendant found not guilty. The verdict came two and a half years after the Watergate break-in and 13 and a half weeks after the trial began. In those weeks, more than 12,000 pages of transcript were accumulated as more than 80 witnesses appeared and 34 of those famous White House tapes were played. <coughs> CBS News correspondents Fred Graham and Jed Duval were at the trial from its beginning October 1st until its end late today. Fred, first, what about the case against H.R. Haldeman? Well, the case against Haldeman was the strongest of all because as Richard Nixon's right-hand man, he was the one most often recorded on the tapes, and they destroyed him. The most damaging was the conversation with Mr. Nixon on June 23rd, 1972, in which they agreed to use the CIA to block the FBI's investigation of Watergate. It was enough to force Richard Nixon from the presidency, but Haldeman told the jury they didn't do it to cover up Watergate, but just to avoid political embarrassment. your present position? I've been in uh, Tehran since the middle of March of this year. And prior to that, were you the director of the Central Intelligence Agency? Yes, I was the director of Central Intelligence was my title. Uh, how long were you a director? Approximately six and a half years. I believe the, I was sworn in on June the 30th, 1966, and I left office when um, Mr. Schlesinger became director on the 2nd of February, 1973. How long did you, how long have you been or were you with the Central Intelligence Agency? From the day its doors opened in 1947. Ambassador Holmes, I'd like to now to direct your attention to June of 1972 and ask you, when for the first time did you hear of the break-in of the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate? 
It's my impression that I heard about it, uh, read about it in the newspapers or heard it on the radio. But uh, uh, this is not any lapse of memory. This is just one of those things that uh, this far, this far back, it's hard to know just exactly who might have told me or how I might have heard it. Certainly it was big news from the moment it happened. And during the days immediately following the break-in, were there conversations at the CIA concerning the break-in? Yes, in the first place, uh, uh, sometime on that weekend, I received a telephone call from Mr. Howard Osborne, the director of security, to inform me that uh, of the names of the individuals who uh, had participated in the break-in, and also to say that Mr. Hunt, in some fashion, was connected with it. Uh, Mr. Osborne's call to me was a perfectly routine matter. There been, uh, it was a, a, a charge on him as director of security to inform me whenever anybody in the agency got in any kind of trouble, whether they're present employees or past employees, in other words, right now, so that uh, I didn't have to catch up with these events like suicides and house break-ins and rapes and the various things that happen to the employees of any organization in a city like Washington. So this was a perfectly routine thing, and when he heard about these ex-CIA people who had been involved in this burglary, he called me up and notified me about it. Uh, on Monday, when I came to the office, there had been no mention in the papers of Mr. Hunt. So I got a hold of Mr. Osborne and said, how come you told me that Mr. Hunt was involved with this? And he said, well, there were some papers found in the hotel room, or one of the hotel rooms was Hunt's name on it, and it looks as though he was somewhere in the area when the break-in took place. So I said, all right. And uh, then from then on, obviously, uh, there were various conversations in the agency as we went to work on various requests from the FBI for information about the people and their background and so forth that had formerly been employed by the agency. Uh, am I correct that James McCord also was a former employee of the agency? He was. And when did Mr. McCord and Mr. Hunt leave the employee of the agency? They, they left it uh, at different times in 1970. They re both retired, as I recall it. Now, directing your attention to June 22nd, 1972, which was the day before your meeting with Mr. Ehrlichman, Mr. Haldeman, and General Walters at the White House, did you have a conversation with Patrick Gray on that afternoon, namely the afternoon of June 22nd? I believe that the committee is in possession of a memorandum which says that our memorandum or a note from Mr. Gray that says I had this conversation. I have no reason to question that at all. I was talking back and forth with Mr. Gray at various times in connection with this uh, uh, Watergate break-in. So I have no reason to doubt that there was one on the 22nd of June. In these conversations, did you discuss the possibility of CIA involvement in the break-in? I assured Mr. Gray that the CIA had no involvement in the break-in, no involvement whatever. And it was my preoccupation consistently from then to this time to make this point and to be sure that everybody understands it. It doesn't seem to get across very well for some reason, but the agency had nothing to do with the Watergate break-in. I hope all the newspaper men in the room hear me clearly now. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, uh, what were Hunt's areas of, of work at the CIA? Senator Gurney, he was with the agency for many years and had uh, a variety of assignments. You might and pull that mic over. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't move it over to you. I beg your <laughs> Thank pardon. You. I had a variety of assignments, and I honestly think it would be putting my memory to too much of a test to remember what they all were. I remember there was one that he had some assignment in connection with the uh, operations leading up to the so-called Bay of Pigs. But this is readily available in the agency. You could get his personnel record, and then it would be accurate. Well, I'm not interested in a detailed account. I <clears throat> wondered if his areas were in the sort of work that he was doing on June 17th. <laughs> it would be hard for me to recall, I don't, uh, but uh, I'd, well, I just don't remember. How often does the CIA help out former employees in the <clears throat> loan of equipment, as in the case of Mr. Hunt? 
Well, I can only say, Senator Gurney, that this was an extraordinary exception. And it was done because we had been asked to do it by the White House. Has it ever been done before, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. Well, has it? <clears throat> do you think it has been <laughs> done before without your knowledge? This is always possible, Senator Gurney. It's a large organization. I would hope not, but I can't say that it uh, had never been done. No, of course but not. But at least no other uh, CIA person has said to you that, yes, we did this on some other occasion with so-and-so. I don't recall that having been said to me. <laughs> well, since this was such an unusual request, uh, why did the uh, CIA go ahead and, and cooperate with Hunt? Well, General Cushman had already authorized this. Uh, as I understood it at the time, on the basis of uh, Mr. Ehrlichman having uh, asked that the agency help. At that time, uh, as I recall it, uh, he was sim Mr. General Cushman was simply told that this was for him to conduct an interview. We had no way of knowing whether this was an interview in the United States or an interview overseas. It had already been done by the time I learned about it. and. Uh, the, uh, what, what was your reaction when Cushman told you? Well, I was not uh, pleased about it because I didn't quite understand why it was that he couldn't have acquired these things someplace else. Well, I must say that same thought occurs to me. If these were routine uh, items of apparatus, uh, the White House certainly would have resources enough to get those themselves. I would have thought so, Senator Gurney. I have uh, learned, uh, I learned when I uh, came back here in May that there were some other things given to him, such as a voice changer or something, and I believe a wig has become uh, almost legendary in this whole matter, but I don't recall anything about the wig at the time, but I don't question that it was done. I... Even though Nixon had stepped aside, the Watergate scandal was still in the news. The New York Times published an article on the 20th of February 1976 entitled Helms Won't Face Break-In Charge, which stated that Assistant Attorney General J. Stanley Pottinger, head of the Department's Civil Rights Division, said he and other officials had carefully weighed evidence to prosecute Mr. Helms for a civil rights violation. However, Mr. Pottinger told a news conference his congressional testimony is under review for possible perjury charges. With an Nixonian man like Pottinger in charge, the former director of the CIA, Richard Helms, appeared safe from prosecution over Watergate. Helms had also denied to the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence that CIA had conducted domestic surveillance or supported political foes of the late President Salvador Allende Gossens of Chile. In the latter New York Times article, it reads, Mr. Pottinger defended the decision not to prosecute Mr. Helms and others involved in the burglary of a photo studio in suburban Fairfax City, VA. That was partly owned by a CIA employee. I had the lead responsibility in the case for the last few months, Mr. Pottinger said. We have spared no resources, no time and no effort. I myself interviewed Mr. Helms. In fact, Mr. Helms was probably delighted to have been interviewed by J. Stanley Pottinger, a man with an abundance of links to the CIA. But there was still even more to discover about J. Stanley Pottinger's involvement in Watergate. In 2005, Bob Woodward, one of the original Washington Post journalists to unravel large parts of the Watergate scandal, released his own book. In The Secret Man, Woodward doesn't only reveal the identity of the Washington Post's main source, known as Deep Throat, for Watergate as being the former FBI's Deputy Director W. Mark Felt, he also explained Pottinger's vital role in hiding this information. Woodward explains that in 1976, the then Assistant Attorney General Stanley Pottinger had revealed to him that Felt had given his secret identity away while testifying before a grand jury. The Washington Post reported in June 2005 that, asked, were you deep throat, Felt initially said, no, but his stunned look alerted Pottinger to the possibility he was lying. The same article also states, in that grand jury proceeding, Woodward writes, Pottinger quietly reminded Felt that he was under oath. He then offered to withdraw the question as irrelevant to the subject of investigation which was the illegal break-ins conducted by the FBI in pursuit of anti-war radicals from the Weather Underground. Felt quickly accepted the offer. Pottinger told Woodward, who didn't confirm or deny his conclusion, that he would keep his knowledge to himself. To his credit, Woodward writes, he did just that. 
Pottinger was a company man. He knew how to keep secrets. He also knew when not to ask questions, and in this case, he even knew to withdraw a certain question from the public record so as to maintain hidden relationships and to protect other company men. a great reset for the post-corona era.